remain in your election command center. Hello, good evening, welcome. This is Hot Edition. We're live on News Up at Desawe Kanda, also live on Kesmi 107.1 in Tamale and beyond. We're live on W93.5 in Wa and beyond. I am Alfred Okansi. My name is Beatrice Edu. This evening, Organized labor to proceed with strike on October 10 as originally scheduled after a heated deliberation on proposals by President Kufuado. We have details of what happened earlier today at that crucial meeting. Also coming up and linked to this democracy, uh, leading member of democracy harm Oliver Bakavomao denied bail for the second time. 21 others, however, have been granted bail. We have details on that for you. Also the strike by Public Services Workers Union leaves Ghana card applicants stranded at NIA offices nationwide. We have details of exactly what's happening there here on Hot Edition on 3FM 92.7. We're live on Kesmi 107.1 in Tamale and beyond and also on W93.5 in Y and beyond. We'll give you an update of what the Minos Commission CEO Martin AC has been saying at the Government Assurances Committee of Parliament when he appeared before them earlier today. Updates on that shortly here on Hot Edition. We've got information as well in his view that there's got I'm saying happening right behind a police station in Enyinem. That's according to the Minerals Commission. We have details of that shortly. We have also the update in business and sport over the next one hour, 30 minutes. Remain your election command center. Grace Omojiman is here with some of the news. Grace. Alfred, let's begin on the labor front because organized labor says it was still set to embark on a strike on Thursday, October 10. This industrial action aligns with its demand for the government to crack down on illegal mining by banning all forms of mining in forest reserves, among other measures. This follows a crucial meeting today to deliberate on the president's request for more time to address their demands regarding the issue. Labor says they are aware of the view that what the government has proposed does not adequately address their demands and therefore their notice of strike remains unchanged. Away from that, the Ghana Police Service has refuted claims of forcing the Stop Galamse now detainees to reenact their protest at the 37 roundabout over the weekend. The accusations arose after lawyers for the anti Galamse protesters reported that some detainees were marched back to the site of the arrest without legal representation. In a press statement signed by its Director of Public Affairs, SCP Grace Ansar Kofi, the police denied the allegations describing them as untrue. The police explained that the activity in question was a crime scene reconstruction, a standard investigative procedure used globally by law enforcement agencies. The chief executive officer of the Minerals Commission, Martin Kweku AC, has said that small-scale mining in Ghana is open to only Ghanaians. He said any foreigner who is engaged in small-scale mining amounts to an illegality. Answering questions before the Assurance Committee of Parliament today, he said that small-scale mining is open to Ghanaians only, so any foreigner who is involved in small-scale mining is illegal. If you take a look at Act 9995, it is even so strange that they even go ahead to say that anybody who goes ahead to solicit for a foreigner to engage in small scale mining amounts to illegal mining. Before we go, the Divisional Executives Council of the Public Services Workers Union of the Trades Union Commission, TU Trades Union Congress, TUC. National Identification Authority, NIA Division, has announced an industrial strike effective today, October 7. A notice issued by the aggrieved workers on Sunday, October 6, indicates that the strike is as a result of the employer's failure to implement the newly approved scheme of service. The aggrieved workers say they will not call off the industrial action until the agreed scheme of service is implemented. That's it for the news summaries. Grace, thank you very much. Uh, well, small news on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. This is Hot Edition. Let's go straight into our first story this evening. As organized labor says, it will proceed with a planned nationwide strike scheduled for October 10, despite its meeting with President Kufuado pleading for more time. It's in line with organized labor's demand for a crackdown on legal mining. President Kufuado, during a meeting with labor on October 3, reportedly asked for more time to enable government to address the issue. However, after a charged meeting earlier today, Labour says 
what the government has proposed does not adequately address their demands, which include a declaration of a state of emergency, revoking LI-2462 and deploying the military to forest areas and water bodies to combat illegal mining, as well as setting up specialized courts to handle Galamse Martes. Secretary General of the Trade Union Congress, Joshua Ansan, told journalists they will proceed with a strike if their demands are not met before the 10th of October, which is Thursday. Labor met this morning to, to this afternoon to discuss the government meeting with organized labor's response. We have concluded as follows. Our strike remains unchanged. I want to repeat, the strike notice remains unchanged. We have the view that what the government has proposed to do does not adequately address our demands. And therefore, and therefore, our notice of strike notice remains unchanged. Thank you. Notice of strike remains unchanged. So all things being equal, organized labor goes on strike on the 10th of October, three days away from today, shutting down effectively government business and with over 700,000 workers. And in its fold, let's engage Abraham Comson, who's General Secretary of the Ghana Federation of Labour, one of the key unions in the Trade Union Congress. M Mr. Comson, good evening. Thank you for joining us here on Hot Edition. Good evening. It's good to have you. First off, I, I hear the uh, Secretary General talk about proposals that government made which did not meet your expectation. What did government put on the table? What proposal did they make that, that did not meet your expectation? So we were expecting the declaration of uh, state of emergency, which the president declared, said no, that was, you can't take that decision. And so that was a very major and important uh, decision that we expected the president to have, you know, uh, accepted or acceded to. Right. Appointing or having the chief justice to establish or the attorney general to establish uh, a court to try people who are arrested and also the revocation of the that LI, which he, the president himself, introduced to allow people to invade the forest, the reserve forest, and all that sort of thing. He said, We're going to revoke it, but how soon? Can you try this man? And here we have problems. The main issue which you have addressed was the declaration of state of emergency. And that one, he said no. So these things that he, he mentioned, how are they going to impact on, on, on the, the situation, this serious problem that we are having, you know, in this uh, forest and then the rivers and all that. So I have my own reservation. Today I was in the meeting, but I wasn't really in tune because there was division, some good, but the TVC affiliate all mm -hmm. accepted, supported the, the, the strike action. EFL to the same. Not Nagra to all, but, but I couldn't see the, the Ghana Medical Association there. Ghana we are taking such action. We need to involve, we have to have consensus to, so that we can make an impact. Mm. See, so that maybe going forward, the other, these, those operating in the critical areas will, 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 will join. I see. I don't, I don't see how this whole thing is going to impact on this stubborn president who doesn't want to do uh, and you're saying that you, you sensed or saw some division amongst you, organized labor, 
today? Because, for instance, Ghana Medical Association wasn't represented at meeting today. Does that mean that if you declare the strike effectively on October 10, they may not take part in the strike or the declaration of the strike by the TUC, the mother body, is binding on all members? I'm praying that they all fall in line. Because after all, what? This is not about a sectional interest that we are fighting. The problem now is about our lives, all of us. So we expected, I, we, I wasn't even expecting any, you know, dissenting views on some of these things. Especially when we know that we are all not safe. Because as we continue to drink water, buy vegetables, fruits, and all that. And we all know that these products are, you know, all contaminated. So uh, I, I was expecting the consensus at this forum so that we can move on. But it was very clear that some groups, even though the majority of the members there supported the sky action, but the few who also had some reasons, because some people say, that, okay, why don't we engage the, the uh, what, the vodka party? And then, I said, ah, why can't you think like this? What mindset is this? How do you engage all the vodka party? People are not in power. Somebody who has been in power for eight years has issued about 2,000 licenses. As against 27 licenses, from 1950 something up to the time that this book took over. And if we cannot read meanings, we, can, we cannot see too that these people, a bunch of criminals who have come to destroy everything, you don't care whether people will eat and die. So I was expecting that, oh, why he is very dangerous because he is our rank and fire. Rise up against the leadership. You can't stop it because it happened in April. 1982, 29th April 1982. Workers marched up at the TC Hall, drove all the general secretaries and their chairman and dissolved. And this thing could happen again because if the <laughs> members see that yes. they are messing them up, mm -hmm. they're not considering their, their interest, their welfare, we are not safe. But and is the is. decision by the TUC, and that's what I wanted to find, is the decision by the TUC binding on member unions? You see, the problem here too is that. We have not structured organized labor. TUC had that authority under the Local Relations Act of 1965. They had that mandate to speak for and on behalf of Ghanaian workers. Now, this law was amended in 2003. And this new act only mentions organized labor. The TUC's name is off. Organized labor from 2003 to date. And we have struggled to structure this because the, the organized labor was not defined in the law. There was no definition for the organized labor. So at the point, even GFI went to court, we challenged the authority and the mandate of TUC to continue to represent Ghanaian workers. The case lasted from 2013 up to 2015 or so. Then we all settled on uh, consent judgment to come back and come and then put our house in order. We've tried, we have developed constitution, we have done everything, we have held series of uh, seminars, workshops, and the TEC has always frustrated this attempt to put in place proper structures. So when it comes to such meetings, for example, like Blaster, right. we don't have any standing <laughs> Blaster. When the time comes, we go to Europe, bring people, we go to Whatever, America, whatever, get so, I see, so th 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 that's what's been happening. Now. I've just got information as well that there was a certain group identifying themselves as concerned members of organized labor, voicing the opposition to how the strike decision was communicated, and uh, the likes of the Technical University Teachers Association of Ghana, TUTAG, and these other groups claim that they were not consulted before the announcement of the strike, so they may not likely take, take part in it. 
is that's that's concerning to say the least. If if the tensions and the division we're seeing now is anything to go by, that is a problem because we have given this government the chance to infiltrate and do their own funny funny things. You see, they have not structured TVC, uh, the the organized government. The TVC are sitting there and they claim to still represent the network. They don't have that authority. They don't have that mandate. And they have been writing to convene meetings. So some people can choose to come. Some can decide to stay away. And we have been pushing that. Why? What is preventing us from putting in place an organized labor structure? We register it as a union, then we work with it. But now, as it is, TVC, they write to people, people they like, they will come. They don't like, they will not come. Once they met last to take this decision of uh, uh, the creation of tech action, yes. Why today, when we met, as if, okay, we, I was not there, I wasn't at the, at the meeting, and uh, why, I mean, horror of confusion at that meeting. So, honestly, organized labor is disorganized. We are not organized. I tell you, going forward, I don't know how, and if we are not very careful, we are going to break up into some fragments that will not be able to even uh, uh, hit a bed and Kill it. Mr. Kumsin, I appreciate your time as always. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. so much. So, General Secretary of the just the Ghana Federation of Labor, there, organized labor is disorganized. And according to his verdict, that could lead to the total breakdown of the labor front. We will keep an eye on this one and see how things play out. And let's stay a bit longer on this because as Abraham Kumsin uh, talks about division within the organized labor, Richard Osamoa, General Secretary of Construction and Building Material Workers Union, also says labor will not back down on the matter. We stand by the decision. And indeed, um, as you saw, or as you witnessed, organized labor was very forthright. We believe that uh, this matter it's a very, very, very critical matter. It's not a matter we should toy with. We think we must march out all the resources and all rally behind the President of the Republic. This is not a fight for just President Akufuadu. It's a fight for the, the entire Ghanaian people. And so we need the fullest support of every Ghanaian rallying behind uh, President Akufuadu to ensure we nip Galamse in the back. Mm. And so it cannot be a wrong timing. In fact, the green the reverse, a better Pram. time back now. Bireme. And so we believe that when it comes to lives, there's nothing like uh, postponing what when lives are Millions of people in Accra. So However, this is the river is now heavily time. polluted. And we the state of the, the river in its home, in the eastern region, under is troubling. Should be able to Residents who rely the on the water for their daily jobs are no longer able to use it. And get uh, the country back on track. Because we are not able to use it. People are contracting ten months. But by five days and six days ago, the one who is here to be say that the church is here to be here to be here to be Mariam has lived uh, not far from the nation. Once that is done, all, all the others life. will follow. She tells and me so the present state of the river is, is alarming. Uh, As you can see uh, about the river, look at the color. The reserves or and look at how the dance is coming. That, that condition I never seen dance like this since they born me. I, I never seen Richard everything Samoa, like the General Secretary of Construction and Building Material Workers Union speaking to Labour First correspondent and still on this, Accra is suffering from the devastating impact of illegal mining activities as the Wager Dam, who takes its source from the Densu River, is also now polluted. The Wager Dam supplies portable water to an estimated 6 million people in the Greater Accra region. Let's get the details of it through this report from Stanley Niblo. The rivers Pra, Birim, Tano, Ankobra and Bonsa have been heavily polluted following uncontrolled illegal mining activities in them. These rivers have been polluted with mercury, lead and cyanide, thus posing a threat to aquatic life and humans who rely on them for survival. 
the Densu River, which takes its source from the Etiwa Forest in the eastern region and enters the Gulf of Guinea at Botiano in the Greater Accra region, continue to provide safe drinking water to millions of people in Accra. However, the river is now heavily polluted. The state of the river in its home in the eastern region is troubling. Residents who rely on the water for their daily chores are no longer able to use it. But by five days and six days ago, you want to see a color, we say, I touch you, say, you want to see a color, go for it here. I, yeah, in time, I want to be in the sun, so yeah, it was a senior, I just a couple, I was in the sun, so they see near my view. Tell you, so why would you want to do so? I shouldn't so no. So when you mean the sun, so I, then you call away night. Mariam has lived not far from the Densu River all her life. She tells me the present state of the river is alarming. As you can see about the river, look at the color. And look at how the Densu is coming. I never seen Densu like this since they born me. I never seen everything like this before. Me, as I can say now, is about the galamse. I use this to bath, I use Densu to cook, but for now I can't feed the water. I will always say it. The galamse is not good. They have to stop it. They have to stop it. Currently, fishermen in some have halted fishing activities in the Densu River. But of more concern is the gradual pollution of the Weja Dam as a result of the spill effect of galamse activities upstream. The color of the water in the dam is turning brown, endangering potable water supplies for millions of people with intense calls for government to act. Residents who are witnessing the change in the water turbidity are concerned about the implications. The case involving the wager dam pollution has been a trending issue on social media. The Ghana Water Company Limited is yet to respond to the public concern. But the sad reality is that Galamse is polluting our water bodies and the government must intervene. Government must intervene. That report was filed by Stanley Nee Blewo and still staying with its leading member of Democracy Hub, Oliver Bakavomowo, has been denied bail again, this time by an Accra High Court. 21 others, including Felicity Nelson and Elom Abebio, also known as AMA Governor, were however granted bail upon their third time asking. These are part of 53 protesters who took part in a three-day demonstration against illegal mining. Lord Edouard is our court correspondent. He sat through the proceedings and came through with his report. Two separate courts had the bill applications of 22 Democracy Hub protesters who had earlier been denied by the circuit court. Elom Abebio, also known as Ama Governor, and eight others were each granted a 70,000 bill with two sureties. The criminal court four also ordered that they deposit their Ghana cards as well as report to the police weekly until the final determination of the case. Despite an earlier suggestion by Attorney General Gofrey Abouadame to consider the bill applications at the next adjourned date, state attorneys opposed the bill of the protesters. After considering the arguments, presiding judge Comfort Asiame granted the bill application. The eight other protesters granted bill are Emmanuel John, Emmanuel Kobna Ado, Ziblim Yakubu, Ohenebat Prempe, Philip Osukobina, Desmond Akisbik, Van Kofi, and Sadiq Yakubu. In a related case, an appeal by lawyers of Oliver Baka Vomawo, Felix Nelson, and 10 others was considered by the General Jurisdiction 12 of the Accra High Court. Lead counsel for the Democracy Hub leaders, Oliver and Felicity, argue that they were not flight risk and had identifiable fixed places of abode. But presiding judge Aite Amatete raised issue with Oliver Bakavoma's involvement in another offence. He queried that what was the assurance he would show up in court or refrain from engaging in another offence. Dr. Justice Shremsai, however, indicated that despite a treason felony charge, Bakavoma had consistently showed up in court for the past three years. He argued that the present charges were misdemeanors, which would not deter his clients from showing up in court. Justice Ahmad Tese then denied the bill application for Oliver Bakavomao and directed that the circuit courts begin his trial in 72 hours. He said upon failing, the courts may grant his bill application. The judge also granted a 20,000 bill with two sureties each to Felicity Nelson, Cedric Bansa and eight others. 
Let us address how far to that report. You are joined by Noah Damte. He is one of the lawyers for Democracy High Protesters. Good evening to you, sir. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Mm, what will be your interpretation of how things transpired in court today? 21 of the protesters released by the lead convener, uh, Oliver Baka from our denied bail. Yeah, so um, I think from the last time the accused persons were in court, the lawyers for the accused had mentioned that they were surprised the court denied them bail, considering most of the offenses were misdemeanors. So we were hoping that the repeat application before the High Court will find favor in the eyes of the High Court judge. So we are, uh, we are happy that the High Court judge today granted um, bail to most of the people that appeared, um, except Oliver. Um, on Oliver's issue, like your reporter rightly mentioned, um, the court's view, okay, in the discretion of the court, since Oliver, this alleged offense was committed whilst Oliver was on bail, um, the court took an exception and then believed that um, he, he wouldn't grant bail today, but gave the court seven, the executive court 72 hours to hear Oliver's case, else he would be minded to grant bill. So it is, it is a good start for us, but we are believing that, um, like Oliver's lawyer, and Oliver is already standing trial for treason, and he's been attending court and comporting himself um, since that time. It's been three years. He always attends court. He's never missed a day in court. So clearly, um, for offenses which are misdemeanors, Oliver is definitely going to appear um, to stand trial. So we believe that um, in the next time that this application is brought before another court, that court will be minded to grant bail. But all in all, it's been a good day in court today for mm, us. So my understanding on the bit of Oliver Bakavumao is that you're not too disappointed. No, no, we, we are. We are. But, um, you know, looking at what happened today compared to what happened the other time, um, we will say that today has been a good start and uh, we will work on Oliver's and then the other persons remaining for the courts to grant them bail. And have your clients been released from custody yet? I mean, since the court gave them their freedom, as it were. Yeah, so um, we are we are working on some administrative processes before they will finally be released. Because of time, those administrative processes could not be completed. But we have the assurance that tomorrow morning, those processes will be completed and then the police will finally have the copy of the court's order for their release. That means that 21 will still sleep behind bars today? Yes, unfortunately. We'll have to end it here. Thank you very much, Noah. Yeah. Adamte is one of the lawyers for Democracy Heart Protesters. <laughs> So live here on Hot Edition on 3FM 92.7. We're live on Kiss Me 107.1 in Tamale and Beyond and also on W93.5 in Y and Beyond. Our scores of applicants who thrown the premises of the National Identification Authority were disappointed and attended to. We're going to give you details of that shortly and how things are played out uh, today with respect to that particular uh, development there and then also uh, how people have been reacting to the matters in there here on Hot Edition on 3 from 92.7. We're also live on Kiss Me 107.1 in Tamale and Beyond. Remember, we're live on W93.5 in Wa and Beyond. But let's stay a bit further on issues issues of illegal mining because earlier today the minerals commission boss was uh, before the government assurances committee and illegal mining popularly known as galamse is taking place behind a police station at Enyinem in the etiwa east district that's according to the chief executive officer of the minerals commission martin aec several reports made to the police have resulted in no action Mr. AEC made this revelation while appearing before the parliament's government assurance committee earlier today and says that they're worried and questioning how come the police are not taking action the minerals commission boss is however opposed to calls to stop issuing new mining licenses one organization that has been doing quite some work in the etiwa area 
is Arocha Ghana. Darobosu is going to be joining us in a bit to have a conversation on this. But also, I'm say he sees it as denied claims of being understaffed. He insisted that the Minos Commission has sufficient funds to acquire the necessary logistics and human resources to carry out its inspector duties. We have uh, details of this coming through shortly, but that's information right now coming through from the Minos Commission boss who appeared before the Government Assurances Committee earlier today. We'll come back to that shortly uh, as and when we're able to get through to a colleague who was there in Parliament for us. But scores of applicants who thrown the premises of the nation that's the national identification authority were disappointed and unattended to this is because of a strike action by staff of the authority who belong to the public services workers union of tuc the pswu and i division began their intended strike over the government's failure to operationalize the newly approved scheme of service the unhappy stranded applicants find the situation very unfortunate considering the fact that foreign nationals are being attended to under the foreign identification management system and the locals are refused entry to the premises. Let's just go listen to some of the applicants who are stranded at these NI offices earlier today. I stand for NSS and then I have to go for verification. And then during the process, I was told that the Ghana card has a problem, so I have to do a replacement. And then on the replacement, I came here today to get the Ghana card being replaced. But unfortunately, I arrived here this morning, and then they said uh, they are on strike. They are not working today. And there's a challenge because there's a, there's a deadline for NSS verification, which is to on the 15th. And then if you are not able to replace the card and then do the re verification, before 15th, the process will, ended, uh, will be ended and then I will not be able to take my national service this year. I came this morning, they said they are on strike, so I have to go and find a day in camp. And as they are on strike, actually I don't know when they will be resuming. And it has been affected me because I wanted to do the biometric first. I came here on Friday and I did everything. So it was just left with um, them giving me my card, as in me giving them this paper, so that they give me my card and they said they've closed, so we should come on Monday. So we came here this morning and they said that they, they are on strike then. They, they, didn't tell you, they didn't tell you on Friday that they, no. they will be on strike today? No, no, no. They told us we should come for our card on Monday, today. So we came and they said they want strike. Now no kura fia da no ye ba ha na e ba e na chese e omo si ye na ye ma en se omo si ye mra na en se na ye dia be duru ha en se no so e ba ya se nke ti hint bi se bi a omo omo be ko strike se nke ye ye ma fi ablewa ma so ya ma chapter via tu ma be duru e ba ya me fe omo kwa omo nfa Woman, you be a woman, me, who say, and say, woman, can ya, wouldn't so cost like, I don't know, friend me. Some member, a dear woman, your gun, honey, and pull your cook room with tea, and your near ma. Seriously, a hard dream. Because you say, the man who noticed Nebon, foreigners, the only team has his own, but any citizens who team has his team. And yeah, you notice BSA they are on strike until say between hands and then who's a more strike. And so, who feel long journey now by a Omaha, who names the old Kwana Sawaba. When you how long I'm going to resume it from the strike? Look at it. What is going on? Charlie? Thank you. Thank you. you. Well, these are some of the stranded persons who thrown the NI offices across the country. Obviously, uh, not too happy about the development. They want to meet their, these uh, workers there on strike because of these concerns they raise about open, operationalization of a newly approved scheme, which will see to an improved conditions of service for the staff there. Ibrahim Abubakar is our Ashanti regional correspondent. Ibrahim is joining us on, on the telephone. Ibrahim, same situation in the Ashanti region as was witnessed across the country. Exactly, Alfred. Uh, frustration galore. Uh, but in Kumasi, uh, uh, most of the applicants I saw, uh, I would say 70% of them are national service personnel who had to complete the registration process and had to do it with a Ghana card. So, you know, they have a deadline that 
um, the registration must end. And they they are confused. They do not know when the officials will be coming for them to, the, to get their card. And apparently most of them were even scheduled to come today or Monday to pick their cards. And yet they came and no one was there to attend to them. So you could clearly see that they are frustrated. Then we have another badge. Uh, you know, the registration for children between the age of 6 to 14 years was supposed to start today. So we had parents who had brought their children just so they will register for them because you need to come with your parent too. It's also a registered member and has his Ghana card to be able to go through the registration process successfully. So those parents also came. Some said they even had to let their kids skip school today so that they can come and register yet. They came there and they were told that the workers are on strike. Then we have the general group who for some, they just needed it urgently to process their passport. Others also for other documentation. They all came there and they said they were not even aware of any strikes because they didn't get any notice, only to travel from afar to the various registration centers and also have to go back home disappointed. So it's the same situation here. They are just um, expecting that government to engage with these workers so that uh, they will resume their services as soon as possible. Brian, I appreciate you on this one. Thank you so much. And still staying the steam on this matter, Francis Nuzabel is uh, the divisional chair of the Public Services Workers Union and uh, is joining us on uh, the telephone for a quick conversation on this. Francis, appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us here on Hot Digestion. First off, uh, listening to the persons who have been expressing their frustration about this strike today by your members, they talk about not being given notice of the, of the strike and they turned up at their offices only to be met with this disappointment. How's that? Okay, thank you very much. And um, good evening to the uh, or regrettably, we as union or staff cannot be blamed for any chaos that is happening to Ghanaians because of the inability to access the service of uh, the staffs of Ghana can or so, NIA. Also, because we had attempted several to engage management on this very issue, but to no avail. We've written series of correspondences to them. I personally called management, the head of administration and HR, severally, virtually almost twice or twice in eight weeks. I realized that there was no commitment on their part uh, to ensure that the scheme of service has been approved for far too long is operationalized. We have equally written to the board chairman and copied all board members, and we indicated that the levels of agitation of the staff is beyond control at the moment, and we may not be able to control that further beyond the 30th of September 2024. So if by that time our expectations, i.e. the scheme of service being involved by public service commission, subsequently being submitted to say with the commission, where they would have then designed a new salary structure and migration of staff comments and get a reasonable stage of the process by the 30th of september we will not be able to control our people any longer and we will advise ourselves and cannot be blamed for it okay. at least even after the expiration of a 30th deadline mm. one would have expected that a proactive management would have probably if for any reasons you were unable to address the concern the best would have been to engage leadership to understand that we have, we, we, and we know this is your concern, it's a genuine concern, also because you cannot even say it's not a genuine concern. It's a pathetic situation. But they are negligent. They don't, they care the least about the welfare of staff. And I also think that they don't even care about the welfare of Ghanaians who will be stranded on a day like this when they come to access or seek our services. Because it was evident to them that so you don't address these concerns the staff will break out of their liberty, their comfort zone, and they may take themselves into a certain, a certain action. This was anticipated. Any good manager would anticipate these things to happen if you're not addressing the concerns of your senior staff. I see, but uh, uh, very well said. And 
that's by the end of this deadline that you talk about, what were the specific demands that you were making of government that you did not hear anything from them? The demand was very simple. We have a new team of staff that has been approved since March. We are asking that they should operationalize that document, put it into action. And by operationalization of the document means that the document would have been involved a public service commission with the effective date of its implementation of personalization stated in the document. And subsequently, it will have then be moved to the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission, where they will have then designed a new salary structure and migrate all the staff into the new salary structure. That is the operationalization of the document that we're asking for. And this is a realistic time frame, should have been done within a month period. But since March of East October, and it is important to add that. In the history of Ghanaian public institutions, no public institution has ever had their team of service approved after technical validation by public service commission under six months. This is on record. In the case of NIU, surprisingly, the team and staff at public service commission had sleepless nights for two weeks and got this document approved. Unprecedented. It's historic. It has never happened in the history of Ghana. Monitor celebratory. What then were the efforts, the need, that kind of pressure that this team staff of public health committee put up sleepless nights for two good weeks to get this document approved only for management to pass it aside and be roaming around? So for as long as this is not met, you're, you're, you're laying down your tools beginning today, you're not returning to work until these demands are met, correct? It is our top of priority, and we cannot get back to work without the team of staff being operationalized. Right. Because the working document that must be put into use. Francis, appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for your time. And that's uh, Francis Nuzagel, who is a divisional chair of the Public Services Workers Union, and talking about the NIA officers, uh, these uh, various officers across the country, who laid down their tools beginning today. If you intend to go there in the coming days, you would go and meet an empty office. They are not working. That's the information that we have right now. And to our earlier story, still on illegal mining, according to the Minos Commission boss, illegal small-scale mining is popularly known as Galamse, is taking place behind a police station at Enyenem in the Tiwa East District. According to the CEO, Martin Ayisi, several reports made to the police have resulted in no action. He made this revelation while appearing before the Parliament's Government Assurances Committee earlier today. So, so why are you still issuing licenses as at, as at now? Sure. Uh, because on your website last week we saw... Uh, new start dates, yeah, 3rd sure. October 2024. Sure, let me One would have thought that in the midst of this crisis, at least you will hold on for a while, there will be a stalemate, so that we can figure out, you know, see our way clear out of this hazy, messy, you know, catastrophic situation. But you are still issuing licenses. Why? Sure, let me, uh, let me explain. I, I think I listened to your Metro and then other people. Uh, as we speak, the issue is not about issuing licenses. If that's a new argument, fine, we can have that debate. Whether or not should we pause, we can do that. The issue is about illegal mining, people working in the water body, people going to the forest, etc. I have not received any instructions from government or minister to say, can you hold on? So, respectively, as I sit here and as we speak, my officers are online processing applications for small scale that have been received over the period, maybe today, last week, last year, because sometimes when applications come in, you have to check to see whether or not he meets all the criteria. So processing applications are going on. If I got the directive from government that, oh, uh, we are declaring a moratorium on processing of applications that will comply, maybe your question is, uh, in the midst of all this, will you recommend to government to stop processing if you ask me, rather than tell you, let me go and think about it and come, Chair, again, respectfully, if you stop, you complicate the issues. 
us the CEO of the Minerals Commission, Martin AEC, there, and uh, still talking about the matters arising at that committee hearing today. We'll have further conversation across our bulletins here on Hot Edition on 3 from 92.7, also on, on TV3. So stay with us as we get some reactions to the position as espoused by the Minerals Commission boss. Let's move a bit away from the legal mining uh, menace and the judicial service is fighting off claims that the Supreme Court is deliberately delaying the adjudication of cases against the anti-LGBTQI bill. This comes barely 24 hours to a protest to demand immediate resolution by various groups in support of the bill. George Quening is at a news conference organized by the Judicial Service. He joins us live on the line. George, can you give us the explanation uh, that the service has been offering uh, regarding the delay? So, like you rightly mentioned, uh, this was the office of the uh, Chief Justice that had this press briefing on the passage of the Human Sexual Rights and Family Values Bill. So after the bill was, you know, was, was um, passed, some cases were passed, that's Dr. Prince of Peru Crown versus the Attorney General, and the case of Dr. Armando Dwey versus the Speaker of Parliament and the Attorney General, and Richard Kai versus Parliament of Ghana and the Attorney General. So all these cases are what have been, you know, delayed. And so they came out clear that the reason why they've been delayed is the fact that these people have not filed the necessary documents. And so if they are ready to do that, uh, they can hear their cases. So they also assure the general public that uh, the Supreme Court registry is ready to receive all processes that need to be filed. And also the Supreme Court is ready to hear every matter where parties have filed, uh, has complied with the rules of court, directing the processes to be filed before a hearing is held. So the person that spoke on behalf of the Chief Justice is also a Justice of the High Court and is the registry of the Supreme Court. That's Justice uh, Ellen I am. So this is what she has to say. Constitution. Now, the case of Dr. Amanda Odoi versus the Speaker of Parliament and the Attorney General was filed on 11 June 2023 on grounds that Parliament had contravened Article 108 of the 1992 Constitution in the passage of the bill. Parliament filed its defense in the form of a statement of case in March 2024. Parliament was supposed to file a statement is defense within 14 days of the notice of the action. However, Parliament filed its defense on 14th March 2024. The Attorney General has not filed a defense in the form of a statement of case. Neither have the three parties filed the issues to be decided by the court as directed by the Supreme Court Rules 1996 CI 16. Now, in respect of Richard Sky versus Parliament of Ghana and the Attorney General, it was filed on 5th March 2024. The plaintiff also wants a declaration. The plaintiff also wants a declaration, among others, that the Human Sexual Rights and Family Values Bill was passed in violation of Article 108 of the 1992 Constitution. Neither Parliament nor the Attorney General has filed has, a, has filed a defense in the form of a statement of case. All three <coughs> parties have not filed the needed memorandum of issues that they, need, that they need the court to settle. Now, the Judicial Service issued a statement on the 13th day of September 2024, which gave the above update in respect of the two cases and explained that the parties have not completed the processes they were required to file before the Supreme Court can hear any case. On 1st October 2024, the lawyer for Parliament filed an application asking the court to give permission for Parliament to file its defense, even though they had exceeded the 14 days set by the Supreme Court Rule CI 16. This application will be heard within the first week of the Supreme Court sitting, being the 15th to the 17th of October, 2024. The general public is assured that the Supreme Court registry is here, is ready to receive all processes that need to be filed. The Supreme Court is ready to hear every matter where parties have complied with the rules of court directing the processes to be filed before a hearing is held. 
And you heard the uh, representative of the uh, judicial service uh, speaking or addressing the press earlier. Earlier you heard George Quining, who is also covering that press conference. I did tell you that there's supposed to be a march tomorrow called Family Values March. Uh, hashtag anti LGBTQI plus march and it's happening tomorrow 8th October Obrat Sports Stadium and we do have on the line with us uh, Mr. Thompson, he's a leading member of Arise Ghana. Good evening to you sir, thank you for joining us. Many thanks for having me Beatrice. I suppose you're joining this protest that I just mentioned, Family Values March? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, uh, we've been part and parcel of this protest right from its inception and um, tomorrow we are all joining in and we are entreating all well-being Ghanaians, uh, civil society organizations, religious groups, traditional authorities, uh, uh, you, the media, and all major stakeholders to join in as we uh, file a petition, one with the Attorney General and two with the Chief Justice to expedite action on, on the case pending at the Supreme Court to allow for the precedent to assent to the anti-LGBTQ bill. You just heard the representative of the Judicial Service addressing the media some minutes ago, saying that it's not like the Supreme Court or the court systems uh, want to deliberately uh, delay this whole process. And she went ahead and explained the processes. So aren't you jumping the gun? We are not jumping the gun. I mean, the, I, mean I didn't hear her explanation, but whatever explanation that she is giving, I think it, it's very important that uh, we, must all, we must all adhere to the principle of justice and that we all say that justice delayed is justice denied. Uh, we've had a case where uh, two years ago when the Auditor General, Mr. Domelovo, was uh, hounded out of office, you know, unjustly. Uh, we have found a case with civil society at the Supreme Court uh, challenging his dismissal. The Supreme Court only brought a ruling two years after uh, 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 the Auditor General had been handed out of office. At the moment where the matter had become moot, even though the Supreme Court had declared his removal unconstitutional, the verdict was inconsequential. It had no, it had no, it was of no value. That tells you the importance of the time bound of of, of justice, and so. If you want to administer justice and you, you, you are not conscious of the time boundness of justice and you say because uh, the, the processes or the system does not allow you to deliver the justice at a particular time and you're going to delay it until a time when you feel comfortable or you feel convenient to come up with justice, then what you're doing is, that, then, then you, what you're doing is a clear injustice. And that is why we want the judiciary to understand that they cannot come in the name of, 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 the, of some court processes to say that because of that, uh, 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 we, we should allow them room for them to delay a matter. What can be disposed of, you know, just like any, so many so many cases have gone to the court and have been disposed of in a very swift, uh, you know, and transparent manner. So you say and that so, justice delayed is justice denied, but that's absolutely. also the saying of the wheels of justice uh, turn or grind slowly, but uh, grind exceedingly fine. How about that? What, there are... There are there are there are instances where the rules of justice grind slowly, and the rules of justice grind slowly. That it it, it, it does not conform to cases such as this one. Uh, when we say that just rules of justice grind slowly, it is it is for vindication, issues of vindication when people are accused of crimes, and that they need to, and we know that they need time to be vindicated because of the of the systems that the court process require. But w when it comes to matters of dispensing of issues of constitutional nature that have bearing on the society. And we have a number of cases that have gone to the Supreme Court. We, we saw the e, E-Levy e debacle. We saw a number of cases that have gone to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court have dispensed off in less than a week or two. Why didn't the court come, come, and come, come out and tell us that just, uh, 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 the rules of justice grind slowly and for that matter, they are taking their time to dispense off? And we saw how swiftly when the E-Levy case went to court, mm. the, the court dispensed the case off. Swiftly. And so all we are saying is that there's a very important matter that goes to the core of the societal fiber of the Ghanaian people. And the Supreme Court or the judiciary must be cognizant of that matter, of that, of, of that fact, and take steps to ensure that 
they administer justice in a fair and proper manner, which is which is in consonance with the will of the Ghanaian people. And the Ghanaian people are saying we do not want we do not want any LGBTQ. We do not want to deal with it. We have no but we don't we don't need it in our system and we want to legislate to regulate that and ensure that people do not abuse it in our system or introduce it in our system. Let me ask you my last so, question. I think and people deserve, deserve that. Uh, my last question, very briefly, if you could answer that for us, uh, just what we should expect tomorrow and whether or not you've cleared everything that needs to be cleared with the Ghana Police Service. Absolutely everything has been cleared with the police. And, um, I mean, this is going to be one of the protests that is going to be very, very multidimensional. You have all manner of people from 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 civil society to academia to the general public to religious group to traditional leaders to queen mothers and and, and we have the ghana pentecostal council i mean it's, it's a very diverse group of people who are interested in the protection of the societal fiber and the core value of the ghanaian society you know all coming out in their numbers it's going to be very peaceful but um, we're going to make our case very strongly to ensure that uh, we are able to get this message across. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Thompson, a leading member of Arise Ghana, and Arise Ghana is one of the conveners of this protest, Family Values Protest uh, March, which is expected tomorrow. Uh, you're still here on Hot Edition on 3FM 92.7. Michael Obodu is standing by with the latest in business. Don't go away. It's 61 days to election 2024. Report any suspicious thing you see towards election 2024 to relevant stakeholders. Hello there, good evening and welcome to the business segment on Hot Edition. Coming up tonight, Economist criticizes government's recent economic gains amid IMF staff level agreement for third review, highlighting persistent hardships for Ghanaians. I'm Michael Obudu. I'll bring you details of this and more shortly. Please stay. Well, thank you so much for your time. Straight into our top story, economist Dr. Patrick Isuming has strongly criticized the country's recent economic gains. He argues that the positive outlook, which has facilitated a staff-level agreement from the third, for the third review of Ghana's economic program, does not reflect the reality on the ground. Many Ghanaian families and businesses continue to face significant economic hardships. Dr. Isuming made these remarks during a media briefing at the quarterly economic roundtable by the finance ministry and the University of Ghana themed driving economic growth through small and medium enterprises. Well, I don't think at the moment the improving the macroeconomic indicators we've seen really reflects how people or has transmitted into the lives of ordinary Ghanaian businesses. We've achieved this, for instance, government's fiscal targets have been achieved by imposing more taxes and the burdening ordinary Ghanaians. Utility tariffs are rising. The cost of doing business is rising. The recent inflation number told us that uh, inflation on domestically produced items is way higher. So all of those will tell us, regardless of you know growth being higher than projected or uh, inflation coming down, we still know that the inflation we have is still extremely high. So. I think if you look at the macroeconomic indicators, maybe it will tell you that the program is doing well, but I think underneath that, Ghanaian businesses are really suffering. So here the Professor 
Patrick is assuming speaking there. Now, Nigeria's gross domestic product, GDP, is projected to nearly double by 2026, largely driven by the operations of Dangote's $20, million, $20 billion refinery, according to a recent report by Data Services and Resources Limited. The report, titled Impact of Dangote Refinery on the Nigerian Economy, reveals that without a refinery, Nigeria's GDP was expected to grow by 3% in 2024, increasing to 4.13% by 2030. However, with the refinery in operation, GDP growth is projected to rise to 4.15% in 2024 and reach 6.21% by 2030. This report has the details. Nigeria's GDP at current market prices is forecasted to grow from 234.43 trillion naira in 2023 to 304.8 trillion naira in 2024, with further growth to almost 365 trillion naira in 2025. By 2026, GDP is expected to hit approximately 432 trillion naira, reaching nearly 807 trillion naira by 2030. Designed to process 650,000 barrels of crude oil per day, the Dangote refinery is facing challenges securing enough local crude oil and has had to rely on imports. Once fully operational, the refinery is expected to reduce Nigeria's dependence on imported petroleum products and boost exports of refined products, improving the country's trade balance. The report also highlights that by reducing fuel subsidies and generating significant tax revenues, the Dangote refinery will strengthen Nigeria's fiscal position, providing critical resources for infrastructure and social development projects. That was a three business news desk report, but away from that, chief executive of Start of Setup a Startup and the driving force behind the African Startup Ecosystem Builder Summit and Awards, Kevin Ayaba, has emphasized the critical need for African leaders to create an environment that supports entrepreneurship and innovation. Speaking at the summit organized in Accra, he stressed the importance of policy frameworks that enable economic development across the continent. He also urged African entrepreneurs to embrace collaboration over competition. But also because we are a Pan-African organization, we wanted to talk, speak not only from, I, I live in South Africa, I, I have so many opportunities in South Africa, we could have created this just for South Africa, but we thought it is important that the continent understand that most of us in the, con in the continent work in silos. Most entrepreneurs work in silence. Everybody is competing against against them against themselves. No one wants to. No one wants to. No one wants to collaborate. So that was Chief Executive of Set Up a Startup and the driving force behind the African Startup Ecosystem Builders Summit and Awards, Kevin Ayaba. Now, Aqua Brewers PLC has unveiled Brutal Fruit Spritzer uh, with the variant Rubby apple a refreshing and sophisticated alcoholic drink with subtle fruit flavors the sparkling bubbles beverage is the latest addition to the company's products the brutal fruit ruby apple alcoholic drink is an extract of delicate flavors of fruit for a sensational taste with its vibrant taste and refreshing finish aqua brewery's brutal fruit is set to become your go-to choice for any occasion especially ladies it's soothing i mean it does something in your throat um, like, you know, a fine, refined wine. I would recommend it for every other lady out there. It's very sweet, it's very classy. For any working lady, career lady out there. I'm Frims and I like the drink because it's sweet, it's, it's not hard, it's just really mild and I just simply enjoy it. I think people should try it, especially the women. The country marketing lead for Accra Brewery PLC, Vanessa Kavi, said that the new product is perfectly crafted to delight the senses of women as well as elevate their drinking experience. Ladies need a, like need downtime sometimes, you know. I think we are in a world where um, women need to be celebrated. That's the reason why we're really targeting women, just to be able to give them a time and a break. The 275 ml brutal fruit ruby apple is beautifully bright and bubbly with subtle flavors reminiscent of champagne. 
Well, on that note, that'll be all for the business segment on Hot Edition. For more business stories, please check out our website. It's 3news.com forward slash business. I am Michael Obudu. Thank you for listening. As always, please stay safe. Comprehensive election coverage. Top notch presenters and well versed analysts. Dedicated reporters and correspondents in every nook and cranny across the country. All the action, every incident reported, all the big stories covered, all facts questioned, every figure verified. Monitored and accounted for. The numbers tallied, analyzed, and interpreted. We have invested time and energy in order to bring you a comprehensive elections coverage. The whole world will be watching us on TV, online, and radio. Election Command Center. Facts, analysis, results. 3FM 92.7. <laughs> Welcome back. You're still live here on Hot Edition on 3 FM 92.7. We're live on Kesme 107.1 in Tamale and beyond, and also on W93.5 in one beyond. Let's go to the sports news now. The Black Stars of Ghana are currently having their first training session at their cross sports stadium ahead of their double header against Sudan today in Accra. The Black Stars will host Sudan on Thursday, the 10th of October, at their cross sports stadium for the first leg before traveling for the return leg on 15th of October 2024 and Bill Shen has been monitoring the training session is joining us from the Accra Sports Stadium right now. Bill, what's going on where you are? Yes, uh, Alfred, uh, the Black Stars just completed their first training session. 11 players actually uh, came to the training, including uh, Jordan Ayu, Mohamed Kudus, Antoine Semenyo, Abdul Fatah Isahaku, Elisha Usu. Uh, the two local boys, uh, Isaac Afo and Frederick Asari, who are from the, 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 the Ghana Premier League, all of them uh, attended the training session. Most, uh, on most of the, the time that they actually had the training, they were doing uh, warm-ups, they were doing small-sided games, and a number of fans were just watching on as they tried to entertain them as best as possible. Uh, I spoke to a number of fans, and they were actually impressed with how the, the pitch was looking, because the pitch had been a topical matter in the last few weeks with the closure of the Babaira Sports Stadium and the closure of the Cape Coast Stadium as well. So uh, the fans have been mainly impressed with how the pitch looks. Uh, they feel that this pitch gives the Black Stars a better chance uh, against Sudan in the first leg on Thursday. See, and I recall that earlier, you, the sports journalist, has re had raised concerns about not being allowed access to this sports, that's the Accra Sports Stadium, after the, um, the the pitch was, as it were, refurbished by the National Sports Authority and the Ministry of, of Youth and Sports. Now, for you, as a journalist there, what's your perspective of the field as we're seeing it now? Yeah, so it looks... It looks actually a bit better than I even expected. Uh, I mean, I saw videos um, flying on social media, and usually videos can be very deceptive. But upon coming in to actually watch, you know, the team train, uh, their passes looked smoother. Uh, they weren't really struggling, you know, to move the ball around. And so that is sort of encouraging. But there, there's still some work to be done. I personally have seen a few patches on the pitch, which is a bit concerning. But... It looks better than I expected. Uh, what else I've seen is there's still work actually going on in the stadium. Uh, I've seen some work actually going on in the VIP area to get the VIP area in the best case possible uh, for you know the the big big men to actually come over and watch this game. And and how about the media center as well? Because uh, we got information that that is not looking too good as 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 the pitches. Yes, so at the moment we have not been given uh, access to the media centre. It's locked. The the area we've been given access to is is the pitch, and you know interviews with some of the players, and uh, that mainly is that. 
And how about the washrooms as well? You know the Akraspo Stadium better than I do. It had a very deplorable washroom situation. And um, do you see any indication of some work being done there? Yeah, so I mean, I've been to I've been to the the washroom previously, and I didn't like how it was. The smell wasn't good. How it was well placed wasn't good. But I've seen uh, some number of videos, you know, making uh, flying around of how the washrooms look. And I personally will try and check it out right before I leave the stadium, uh, because uh, for most of the time we've been concentrating on you know getting the sound of the black dust players to see. So right now that is done. The, the next step is to check how the washrooms really look like, you know, for an ordinary fan, if it's conducive enough for an ordinary fan to come in and, you know, feel comfortable. Bill, thank you so much for the update. Bill Ashen, appreciate your time. Uh, Bill Ashen joining us from the Accra Sports Stadium for a quick dose of what's happening in the world of sports. The Black Stars players have already arrived, 11 of them so far. Training ongoing ahead of that clash with Sudan on Thursday, 12 minutes after 6. So live here on Hot Edition on 3FM 92.7. Also on Kiss Me 107.1 in Tamale and W93.5 in Y and Beyond. Before we get into campaign trail. Illegal small-scale mining, popularly known as Galamse, uh, is according to the Minos Commission CEO, Martin Ayisi, Galamse is taking place right behind a police station Atenyenem in the Tiwa East District. And he said this when he appeared before the Government Assurances Committee of Parliament earlier today. In fact, asked a specific question of as to why they're continuously issuing mining licenses when there's this call to ban small-scale mining. This is what he had to say in response to that question that was posed by the chair of the committee, Samuel Okujeto Ablakwa, earlier today at the Government Assurances Committee. So why are you still issuing licenses as at, as at now? Sure. Uh, because on your website last week we saw uh, new start dates, yeah, 3rd sure. October 2024. Sure, let me One would have thought that in the midst of this crisis, at least you will hold on for a while, there will be a stalemate so that we can figure out, you know, see a way clear out of this hazy, messy, you know, catastrophic situation. But you are still issuing licenses. Why? Sure, let me, uh, let me explain. I, I think I listened to your metro and then other people. Yeah. Uh, as we speak, the issue is not about issuing licenses. If that's a new argument, fine, we can have that debate. Whether or not should we pause, we can do that. The issue is about illegal mining, people working in the water body, people going to the forest, etc. Well, so Aula Sewa is the co coordinator of the citizens, eco conscious citizens. That's one of the major um, environmental NGOs in this country uh, championing this fight against illegal mining. I will appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us here on Hot Edition. Good evening. Thank you for having me. So that's the Minerals Commission boss there. It says it's not really a. Uh, that conversation now is not about whether or not to. Uh, halt the issuance of licenses. That it, if 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 it's if it's a new proposal, then then they can look at it, because as we speak, as of the third of October, eleven licenses were issued. Well, I mean, I just am disappointed. You know, it's facts of bad faith. You have um, CSOs, you have Christian Council, you tag. Um, Catholic Bishops' Conference, all coming together to say enough is enough. We are asking for a pause in small-scale mining, community mining, whatever you want to call it. And then you are still issuing licenses, knowing very well that after you issue the licenses, there's no serious monitoring going on. And that is why we have the scale of the catastrophe. So what he's saying, with the greatest respect, is quite disingenuous. He should not be issuing licenses, not at this time. So it, it shouldn't, in your view, shouldn't have come even as, 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 a, as a call or a proposal to the commission, but because of the campaign and the call going on now, that, that should have been the very necessary consideration, is it not? Exactly. I mean, if you want to show some good faith, we have all seen the catastrophe. 
the poison of our water bodies. I don't have to go over it over and over again, rising kidney disease. And we are saying that there must be a pause on small scale mining. Um, organized labor has asked for a ban. We are saying there must be a pause because you're not able to regulate them. So how can you in good faith, how can you in, with any good conscience keep on issuing licenses? When you know very well that they're going to start engaging in mining and nobody is going to monitor them. And this is a time when we are, some organizations are asking for a ban. You know, it just smacks of bad faith. I'm sorry to say that. Is, is, it, is it a clear indication of where we are now with the fight against illegal mining and, and the lack of well, responsiveness? Well, I've said that I'm not sure there's any fights going on. I've said it over and over again. If there are a few comedies going on, once in a while we arrest a few people low down the chain. We know that, uh, for example, the uh, Akonsa mining is alleged to have destroyed part of the Tano Mineral Forest Reserve. Is there even a docket? Uh, ready for uh, for prosecution? No. We have high-ranking members of uh, the ruling party and also the opposition involved or allegedly involved in illegal mining, and no serious action is being taken. It is rumored that the firefighters and the arsonists are one. So how can we be serious about fighting illegal mining? We are not serious, and that is why we have the looming catastrophe. And uh, it's it's painful to have to say that the demonstrators were refused police bail. They were refused initially uh, court bail. They spent some time behind bars for trying to raise awareness about the existential threat we see. While the persons poisoning us are walking free. An example is in a Tronsu, where there's illegal mining going on and the poisoning of their Tronsu stream. The illegal miners were granted bail. After being granted police bail, they happily went back to poisoning the water source. And as I speak, I'm told they're still poisoning the water source. But when it comes to demonstrators, it comes down with them severely. It just gives the impression that we're not at all um, mindful of the fact that we face a clear and present danger. We face an existential threat. Water bodies being poisoned, the food chain being compromised, and our health deteriorating and yet we don't seem to care we're even more concerned about vote and i think the head of the minerals commission should really be taken to task for still issuing li um, licenses at this stage i will appreciate you as always we continue the conversation on ghana tonight thank you so much thank you very much Awala Sewa is the co-chair of the Eco-Conscious Citizens, one of the foremost CSOs in the environmental space in this country, They're talking about illegal mining and martyrs arising. We'll go straight into campaign trail here on your election command center. And on campaign trail tonight, we start from the camp of the opposition and DC and the flag bearer, John Mahama, says that the path to a peaceful election hinges on the groundwork before the polls. He thinks that the ultimate responsibility lies with the Electoral Commission and its readiness to conduct fair and impartial elections on December 7. Noble Crosby Annan has the rest of the story. The president was speaking during a meeting with a pre-election assessment team from the West African Elders Forum, led by former Nigerian President Good Luck Jonathan. John Dramani Mahama stressed the importance of addressing key concerns raised by his party, the NDC, particularly regarding the voters' register. He called for comprehensive operations by all stakeholders, especially the Electoral Commission, to ensure a peaceful and transparent electoral process. We have an election in barely 62 days now, 61 days, and um, there have been a few issues uh, bubbling back and forth, um, especially with the Electoral Commission and uh, issues to do with the register. So we're happy that um, a high-level delegation like this is here so that we can go through some of the concerns we have. We all want a peaceful election. But a peaceful election is predicated on the groundwork and the preparation that is done before the election. I'm sure that if we get everything right, 
in the lead up to the election, then the election will be peaceful and successful, especially with the EC that is supposed to be the neutral arbiter and umpire. We should be able to uh, get it right again. Leading the pre-election assessment team from the West African Elders Farm, from a Nigerian president, Good luck, Jonathan emphasized the farmers' mission to reduce tensions across the continent, particularly during election periods. The purpose of the West African Elders Forum is to see how we can bring tension down in the sub-region. We are not immune to conflicts, and uh, we've seen that there are a lot of conflicts in the continent and conflicts in Ecuador. And most of the conflicts are related to elections, and that's why we are playing, uh, placing so much emphasis on the uh, election. He noted that the forum strongly prioritizes the prevention of election-related crisis through pre-election engagements aimed at mitigating tensions before they escalate post-election. We believe that uh, when elections are coming up, we don't want to wait until at the end of the elections and when there are major conflicts before you step in to mediate. And we feel that we should prevent the uh, crisis from even coming. So we visit countries before the election and will also come during the election. But we are there to mediate, to make sure that elections are done properly. We follow the regional and uh, international protocols guiding uh, elections and uh, where it's necessary for us to mediate, we, we mediate so that parties don't really go into confrontation that will create uh, areas of conflict. conflict. Speaking after the closed-door meeting, spokesperson Sir John Dramani Mahama, Joyce Bar Mokhtari, highlighted some topical issues raised during the meeting. They had various conversations regarding the work of government, the work of the Electoral Commission, the appointment of all these very partisan individuals to the commission. They talked also about weaponizing the judicial process even in some cases considering the numbers and certainly the issues to do with the uh, peace agreement also came up and Mr. Mahama spoke about the fact that we need to be reassured that the electoral commission is for all of us and on behalf and you heard that uh, Joyce Bar Mokhtari, spokesperson for the former president John Mahama ending that report by Noble Cosby Annan it's alive here on Hot Edition on 3FM 92.7, also on Kiss Me 107.1 in Tamale and beyond. We're live on W93.5 in Wa and beyond. <laughs> from um, election matters. The Ghana Police Service has launched a manhunt for Bright Tete, also known as Kofi Y2K, a suspect to escape from custody following his arrest in connection with a robbery incident at Seshi Abrokwefe in the Western North region. The suspect, along with his accomplice, Yauteria alias Jaboy, were apprehended on September 23, 2024, after they robbed their victims of valuables, including gold, concentrate, and several mobile phones. The arrest was made possible with the assistance of community members, a police statement sta stated, which we have a copy of right now. However, in a dramatic turn of events, Bright Tete managed to escape from police custody, prompting an urgent manhunt to recapture him. Meanwhile, suspect Yauteria remains in custody and is aiding the police with their investigation. So that's the development coming in there. Let's just stay a bit further with the Ghana Police Service. And there's another statement that's just come through right now with respect to the reconstruction of a crime scene, which the Democracy Hub has issued a statement at about some five hours ago indicating that the police forced some persons in the reconstruction of some of the crime scenes at the September 21 that is a uh, demonstration by the Democracy Hub. The Ghana Police Service has refuted claims of forcing the Stop Galamse now detainees to reenact the uh, protest at the 37 runabout over the weekend. The accusation arose after lawyers for the anti Galamse protesters reported that some detainees were marched back to the site of the arrest without legal representation. In a press statement, which you have a copy of, Director of Public Affairs, ACP Grace Ansakrofi, indicated the police 
did not force them, essentially explaining that the activity in question was a crime scene reconstruction, a standard investigation procedure used globally by law enforcement agencies. Crime scene court reconstruction as part of an investigation is a standard practice used by law enforcement agencies worldwide and is in full compliance with our establishment and our procedures. Unquote. That's a statement which we got a copy of earlier today and that's it for Hot Edition on 3FM 92.7. There's more news on 3news.com. Take some time and visit 3news.com. Join me at 10 p.m. on TV3 for Ghana Tonight. On behalf of the rest of the team here on Hot Edition, I appreciate your company. My name is Alfred Akonsi. My name is Beatrice Edu. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, also join me at 9 p.m. on Agenda on TV3. Have a good evening and do enjoy the rest of our programs.